Hi, my name is Holly, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Washington in the Department of Chemical Engineering, and I have the honor of doing my research in the lab of Elizabeth Nance. I'm also very excited to be giving my first JupyterCon talk in the scientific research category. My talk is about how we use Jupyter Notebook as a medium for experimentalist and data scientist collaboration in neural imaging. And since our lab takes such cool images of the brain, I thought we'd dive straight into a picture from our most recent publication in Bioengineering and Translational Medicine of microglia, the immune cells of the brain, interacting with nanoparticles. But as a lab, we don't like to look at the microglia and nanoparticles independently. We like to look at them in a bigger picture of the brain system. And so we choose to work in ex vivo slice models, which allows us to save animal numbers because instead of using one brain, we take a brain and we slice it. And we can use every individual slice as an individual experiment. And those experiments fall into three treatment groups. One, our non-treated control. Two, our injured group, which for this paper is oxygen glucose deprivation. And three, our treatment group. We place nanoparticles into all of these slices to see how they react in the brain microenvironment in the presence of injury and treatment. And all of this methodology relates via the hypothesis that oxygen glucose deprivation alters features of the brain microenvironment, which can then be leveraged by nanoparticles for investigation and treatment. I hope that the complexity of these images shows the necessity for us to break this down into four main areas in our lab, which is one, developing slice culture models, such as OGD, what we use here, two, measuring transport in Lyme tissue, so we not only take images of nanoparticles, but we can actually watch them and track their diffusion and interaction in their microenvironment, three, engineering nanotherapeutics, we can take what we have learned and apply it into treatment of disease, and four, characterizing brain injury, which is where most of my work falls under. So when we talk about this bigger hypothesis, because of its complexity, we're actually able to break it up. And I have a hypothesis that falls into this first category, that oxygen glucose deprivation actually induces detectable phenotypic changes in microglia that provide insight into the greater brain microenvironment. It's been known for a while that microglia phenotypically change in response to many factors, such as those pointed out by Dubilar and Frontiers in Immunology, including age, brain region, and disease, amongst others. Now, it's also been known and pointed out by Venakis and Frontiers in Cellular Neuroscience that in response to ischemia, what we're modeling with oxygen glucose deprivation, microglia not only change from resonant microglia phenotype to activated microglia phenotype, they also likely change alongside monocytes into phenotypes of M1 and M2 macrophages. So when we're studying cell shapes in our experiments, we actually get to study and quantify the difference in cell shape features amongst our groups, such as the injured group OGD at half an hour here and our non-treatment group. Just by the eye, it seems like the OGD cells are slightly more circular than the non-treated groups. But we can actually quantify this with features such as perimeter, area, and major and minor axis amongst others. And when we do, for this paper, we found that in comparison to our non-treated control, our injured group actually tends towards more circular. And then when we treat it with our treatment, it goes back to a pattern that's similar to our non-treated control. Alongside these um, quantitative cell shape features, we actually perform vampire analysis, visually aided morphophenotyping image recognition, a package from the Dennis Wirtz group at Johns Hopkins, which allows us to take images of our cells and create representative phenotypes of their outlines. So we can upload all of our data and split it into testing and training groups and create these dendrograms of representative shape features. And those produce a frequency of how much each representative shape feature occurs in every image in every region and across every treatment group. And when we compare those, we found that there's actually a difference from the non-treated control in our injured group and that that reverts after treatment. But it's important to understand that these results are a part of a whole, that the inducing detectable phenotypic changes and my work on cell shape analysis is a part of a whole that relates to how cell phenotype is um, connected to disease and how we can then develop nanotherapeutics to leverage the brain microenvironment with nanotherapeutics to treat disease. That this part of a whole and the complexity of the brain microenvironment actually necessitates 
necessitates effective collaboration. And when we're collaborating amongst only the lab and these four huge parts, in order to create a cohesive paper with a hypothesis and results that make sense, we're actually already using nine independent researchers that have trained 17 undergrads and seven high schoolers across the period of this paper that have been trained by or used techniques and equipment from nine collaborators across three institutions and five departments. So when we talk about neuroimaging and collaboration, we'll get to the Jupyter Notebook, but in order to understand why it's so useful for us, first we want to talk about how we train our collaboration. So when we collaborate, what we do is we actually take some of our experimentalists and we train them in data science, such as me. And then we take our non-data science experimentalists and we have them produce images, which are then analyzed by our domain science trained data scientists in order to provide results. And this allows us the unique insight that our collaboration on this hypothesis can begin at ideation. And when we're talking about neuroimaging and collaboration, everyone gets to be at the talk board discussing questions and hypotheses, treatment groups and experimental methods with the same knowledge base in domain science. And then we get to discuss data science results and how to connect those in a way that makes sense to an experimentalist. And the way that we've really found makes sense is by using Jupyter notes book. But to fulfill our hypothesis, we need a process for efficient implementation and future scalability. So we developed our fiber framework. It's a framework for neuroimage-based experimental routines that follows six steps. One, we develop a data awareness as a group. Two, we design a data management plan. Three, we determine an optimal experimental pipeline. Four, we build out the data science infrastructure. And then five, we perform our supplemental and primary imaging to finally produce interpretable visualization. What's great is that we actually do all five steps in a meeting in Jupyter Notebook. So we design at least one notebook per paper where we include things like experimental steps that exist before data science. All the data science steps we can already tell are going to need to go into this. How our personnel workflow will exist. What all our data locations file types are. We can talk about treatment, every region we're interested, every stain that we've used. And we can actually extrapolate from that how much data we will have and how much data will need to be processed in that notebook before we even get to the notebook. And by the end of the fiber process, we have an understandable notebook that is data designed and experimentalist driven. So that experimentalists understand where we're coming from. When we reach step six, producing interpretable visualizations of results, we actually take the same notebook and we just go ahead and fill it in with data science. We can build out packages in order to support it. We can build in places for our experimentalists to have input. We can take what they've already seen and helped us design in order to create an experimental pipeline that makes sense. And while I showed you this Jupyter notebook for one specific experiment, it's important to understand that our experiment here is just the start of how this pipeline and method can be used. There's so much complexity to our images and so many factors that affect microglia phenotypes that we want to actually apply the same pipeline and notebook to so many different images. But what's important in order to be efficient about our time is that our experimentalists cannot always be dependent upon our data scientists for their analysis. We need to have a way that our experimentalists can actually take their images and perform their own analysis with our pipeline, leading to experimental independence and freeing up data science time for feature addition. So in order to do this, we need effective independent education for experimentalists to empower their analysis while freeing up data scientists' time for package and notebook expansion. And we do that via textile, Tutorials for Experimentalist Interactive Learning, which is completely built in Jupyter Notebook. We've already created six modules that we combine a data science method or learning technique with something specific for our experimental image processing. And we develop these modules in Jupyter Notebook so that every trainee does a module activity in Jupyter Notebook and then followed by a module taught by a data scientist. They do a recall activity and then they provide feedback about how effective that method was. 
we are creating them to be accessible online right now. And we've already tested this with six high school students, four undergrads, and five graduate students that are successfully able to implement the notebook shown before. And it works just by having one notebook that we can explain what we're doing. We have example data from our actual papers. And then we have the modules that have a pre-module activity that every student walks through before they talk to a data scientist, followed by an expanded lesson that goes into how the code works to give a streamlined method for experimentalist independent education. So this all fits into this like three piece framework for us where scientific research fits with fiber via effective experimental preparation. Fiber fits with textile and education via dynamic knowledge transfer and textile supports our scientific research by providing building blocks for future experiments and analysis. That all three of these things are so important that they allow us to make get obtain meaningful results for interdisciplinary research while training experimentalists to use our tools and freeing up our data scientists for future expansion where we can take this complexity and we can add in other cell features and run analysis on multiple cell types since microglia aren't the only cells in the brain and there's so many features we can look at that we can take textile and build modules that are based on the theory behind like the ex vivo slice methodology that informs this experiment and that we we can also put all of these things together and support new collaborations. This paper has so much other data in it that shows this difference between injury and treatment, such as fluorescent assorted um, cell sorting. And we can combine all of that if we have researchers that are empowered to understand data science and data scientists that are free to explore new applications. And finally, I would like to thank my whole lab, how amazing they are. They're so supportive. Everyone highlighted here was either a part of this paper or they've been trainees through the textile process. And I want to thank uh, JupyterCon for allowing me to give this talk. Thank you.